so we are going to instead turn to our next speaker, Brian Honigman. He is the CEO of Honigman Media, a content marketing consultancy. Brian is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the World Economic Forum. He'll be talking to us about Twitter and Facebook as lead platforms for your social media. Thank you. Brian, please. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want to start by thanking NATO and the team for having me. Um, I'm Brian Honigman, and I'm going to be talking about how to best use Twitter and Facebook as a lead platform for your organization. Now, as you know, most nonprofits, international organizations, government agencies are already active on Twitter and Facebook. They have that in common. But unfortunately, what's also common is that most organizations are not active on Twitter and Facebook in a meaningful way. They're not driving the results they're looking for. They're not achieving their goals. And if that's the case, what's the point of being active there? The goal of my talk today is to help you be more purpose-driven with your use of Facebook and Twitter as lead platforms. Your organizations exist to help solve a unique challenge, help address a singular purpose, and that needs to be articulated effectively with your messaging on both platforms in order to succeed, in order to reach your goals. So let's set the stage a little bit. What is a lead platform? A lead platform is a digital marketing channel that you choose to be active on versus the many other options on the social media landscape. As you know, there's a new channel, new feature, new update that feels like you have to be you know, focused on learning all these things on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. It can be overwhelming. If your institution tries to be active on every one of these channels, if you try to be everywhere, you might as well be nowhere. If you're, you'll be spreading yourself way too thin. That's why a lead platform is where you're prioritizing your organization's investment for the future. A lead platform has an audience, and an audience at scale, and the individuals that you're trying to reach on a regular basis are active there. By regularly providing their attention there, you have the ability to reach that audience by providing value equal to the attention you're gaining from that audience. This exchange is a dialogue. A lead platform allows you to have a two-way communication and it's not a place for pure monologue. It's not a place to broadcast your message without listening to others. You have to get their feedback and apply that to your messaging. And you have to communicate with them and speak with them at their level. A lead platform drives ROI for your organization. A lead platform drives return on investment, meaning a lead platform helps you achieve your goals, whether your goals are to you know, drive further awareness about a particular cause, increase donations, or be thought of as the leader in your particular niche. So why are Facebook and Twitter considered lead platforms worth further investing in today? Let's start with Facebook. Facebook, without a doubt, has access to audience at scale like no other channel. On August 27th of this year, over a billion people logged onto Facebook in one day. Without a doubt, a portion of your audience is there and active and providing their attention, and you have the ability to deliver value and gain some of that attention as a result. Facebook allows you to target these individuals on a regular basis based off of demographics like age and gender, based off of their interests like literature or movies. You can even target people on Facebook based off of the weather they're experiencing in a specific geographic region. This level of targeting is extremely useful, and once you've reached that audience, you can deliver value in a multitude of ways. In this example here, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the US, partnered with Univision News uh, on Facebook to answer questions on their Facebook page. Uh, at the time, uh, Tropical Storm Erica 
was uh, coming up the southeast uh, coast of the US, and people wanted to know what they should do to best prepare for this. So FEMA took about an hour and answered questions that people had, like, how should I prepare for the storm? Um, how should I stay up to date on the latest news about the upcoming storm? And most of all, how do I stay out of harm's way? FEMA answered these questions without a doubt providing value and reaching a broader demographic than they were able, able to before. And lastly, Facebook is continually investing in its own future, therefore is dedicated to investing in its user base and the organizations trying to reach that user base on a regular basis. As of today, two-thirds of the world's population does not have access to the internet. Facebook's program, internet.org, is, is setting out to solve that problem head on. By partnering with multiple uh, other large corporations, they're working with local telecom companies in the third world to create free mobile apps to deliver to underserved communities, and they're creating drones to beam down Wi-Fi across the developing world. Without a doubt, this is a value to everyone involved, bringing a, a greater exchange of knowledge, allowing people access to information on crop rotation for the very first time, children access to Wikipedia at school for the very first time. Obviously, there's a direct benefit for Facebook as a business to have more people online, that's the more people they can turn into users. But as an organization, you have the ability to reach a community and many new communities that have never before been active online. Twitter, as a lead platform, has a lot of similarities to Facebook, but a lot of unique differences. Uh, first off, they have an audience at scale. Uh, every day, 500 million tweets are sent from Twitter on everything from pizza and cat emojis, silly stuff, to serious issues like gay rights and climate change. The, the big difference here is that it's a little bit more difficult to target and reach your audience on a regular basis on Twitter due to the nature of how the network is set up. Everything is kind of shared in, in a sequential order. So to better target your audience on, on, on this lead platform, you have to create conversations and join in conversations around real-time moments and live events, one of the main uses of Twitter whether that's an election, a political crisis, an economic debate, a conference, to best reach your audience on Twitter and provide value, you have to match up with the conversations happening around these real-time moments. Once you've reached your audience on Twitter, you have the opportunity to provide value in multiple ways. One feature that is particularly of use, especially to this audience, is Twitter alerts. Twitter Alerts is a feature offered to government agencies and organizations focused on providing emergency services that allows these institutions to send their tweets as mobile alerts during a time of crisis. So to ensure that the, the information they're trying to get to users that opt into these alerts, to ensure this information gets them and isn't lost in the Twitter feed. In fact, just last week, uh, a 20-year-old woman was rescued uh, during the, the, the massive flooding uh, cr across Japan. She saw one of the Twitter alerts uh, posted saying, if you are in need of help, it's a time of crisis, please tweet us your location, as much information as possible, and we'll do everything we can to come find you. And it's, that's exactly what she did. She said, I'm isolated, I can't get out of the area I'm in, I'm, I'm flooded, what should I do? And she was rescued, life saved. Obviously, very clear exchange of, uh, of benefits uh, in, in this circumstance. And lastly, Twitter has access to a larger ecosystem, similar to Facebook, how they're growing with Instagram and WhatsApp. By investing in Twitter, you also get access to an investment in Periscope and Vine, allowing your organization to reach a broader audience with new formats of storytelling. But unfortunately, like I mentioned in the beginning, sad face, uh, most organizations aren't using these platforms in a compelling way. 
They're not achieving their goals. They're not articulating their purpose. And they're facing many key challenges. There's a really huge lack of understanding of how your audience is actually using Twitter versus Facebook or Facebook versus Snapchat. This causes the wrong types of content to be shared on these channels on a regular basis. This leads to not using all the feature sets that both of these lead platforms offer to your organization to reach your audience on a consistent basis. Another really big challenge that everyone is well aware of, I'm sure, we have a limited access to resources, limited budget, time, talent, and it's stretched thin. And unfortunately, this leads to cutting corners. Oftentimes, an organization doesn't have a developed social media strategy, or if they do, it's verbal, it's not documented. It's not helping them reach their goals and stay on course with articulating their purpose. And due to the fact that your resources are limited, there's less buy-in from leadership. You have a limited budget spread across multiple initiatives. Sometimes social takes the hit. Every day, it gets more and more difficult to stand out on these platforms in a meaningful way. Like I said earlier, there's 500 million tweets sent every day on Twitter. How are you going to stand out? And this is only growing. Unfortunately, this leads to a lack of results. You're not seeing the same KPIs being hit that were hit six months prior. And unfortunately, this leads to a lot more broadcasting across social media. You're not using Facebook and Twitter as a, as a way to have a dialogue with your audience. You're purely promoting, thinking, OK, if I just share more content more often, then I'll reach my audience. Then I'll be able to stand out in a compelling way. And that doesn't solve the problem. And lastly, there's an issue with integrating global teams, whether it's connecting your different divisions, your different departments, your different locations to use social media in the same way aligned with your goals. This leads to misusing your limited resources, missed opportunities, and in many cases, it further misaligns your messaging and leads to less results. This is why it's really important that you stop what you're doing, stop, and refocus. Take a second to analyze what's actually working with your use of Twitter and Facebook. Take a moment and see what's not working and see how you can fix that. See how you can ensure your goals are being achieved on a regular basis. We can bring some smiles back to your use of Facebook and Twitter by taking the following steps into mind and using these platforms in a more purposeful way. First, better understanding the psychology of your audience on both Twitter and Facebook. This can be done in a plethora of ways, one of which is doing the research, analyzing some of the many studies that are published on how Facebook and Twitter users are actually using these platforms. Another way is to conduct your own research, send out a survey, create a focus group, wherever you can get more information on how your organization can better integrate and have meaningful conversations, the better. One such study that you should consider when using Facebook to reach your audience with your purpose <clears throat> was published by the New York Times. It's called the Psychology of Sharing Study. The study found that there was five main reasons why someone decides to share a piece of content on Facebook. Number one, we share content on Facebook to bring value to other people. Mom, boyfriend, cousin, colleague, I found this of use, now I'm sharing it with you. Second reason, we often share content on Facebook to help better define ourselves. These are the issues I stand for. These are the issues that I don't stand for. The third reason, that we share content on Facebook to help further nourish and grow our existing relationships. I'm thinking about you. I care about you. Your relationship is meaningful. I'm going to share with you 
on Facebook with this particular link, photo, et cetera. For the fourth reason, we share content on Facebook for self-fulfillment. So people share content to feel satisfied, to feel happy, to feel vindicated, and more. And lastly, we share content on Facebook to regularly drive more awareness to the issues and causes that matter to us. So whether that's autism awareness, whether that's climate change, Facebook is a means of letting people know what they should be paying attention to and what issues really matter. Another study conducted by Cornell University on the use of Twitter analyzed 1.7 million tweet pairings, lined them up side by side to analyze which tweets got more retweets. What elements did these tweets have to make them more effective than the less engaged tweets, the tweets that weren't shared as often. They found that there was four elements of a more retweetable tweet. If, you, if anyone doesn't know what a retweet is, it's when you um, share the tweet of someone else with your audience. So your tweet can generate retweets and further distribute it across the Twitter ecosystem. So tweets that were more successful at generating engagement included helpful wording. They helped uh, your audience better understand what to do next, how to take action from reading that tweet. The second element that more engaging tweets had was they provided more information. They gave you a better understanding of the context in which this subject is living in. Another element of more successful tweets is that the they had aligned language. So not just spoken language like your tweet was written in Spanish versus English and French. Obviously, that's very important. But it's also having the right tone with your audience, having the right reading level to ensure you're talking to the people you're trying to reach in the same way that they talk to each other, not PR slang or kind of government terms, but more so at the right reading level so they can comprehend what you're trying to share with them. And lastly, the fourth element that made a tweet more engaging to generate more retweets was when the tweet mimicked news headlines, when it offered a relevant snapshot of that subject that someone could quickly read and, and take in and understand how to move forward with. Um, so this is just two examples of studies that you could kind of keep in mind and, and apply to your social media use mo moving forward. There are many, many, many others, and I highly recommend you stop, take the time, and do some research as to what your audience is actually doing with these platforms before you continue to share content with them on a regular basis. Another key step to this kind of research phase and refocusing what you're actually doing is understanding the feature sets that each channel offers especially the unique feature sets that each channel offers. So you understand why that particular lead platform is important in your overall marketing mix. If you need to, list them out. Facebook has X, Y, and Z. Twitter has X, Y, and Z. This is how we're going to use that feature. This is how we're going to use this feature. For example, native video on Facebook does fantastic today. So what, what is native video? When you upload a video directly to Facebook, instead of sharing a link to a YouTube video or a Vimeo video, you upload the video directly to your Facebook page, and it's a far more compelling way of reaching your audience on the channel because Facebook's algorithm gives it preferential treatment and because it's more engaging for Facebook users because they don't have to leave the experience on Facebook to go consume the video they can just watch it then and there. It's already preloaded. And this is a fantastic way to articulate your organization's purpose, drive value, um, and cater to the information that your audience is looking for. In this example, uh, which we're about to watch the video, it's from the American Red Cross. It's uh, a quick video on how to better uh, prepare for your beach travels. This was shared a little bit more earlier in the summer, so it was more relevant then. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is because it's directly aligned with the American Red Cross's purpose. 
They're using the feature set to drive results. It humanizes the nonprofit because they utilize one of their staff members to articulate the information for you, and it's short and concise. Let's check it out. If we have an outing to the beach, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I'm going to a beach that is lifeguarded. There are also going to be signs posted at this beach telling information, whether it's clear to swim or there's other issues that I need to be aware of. I need to fully pay attention to those as I go through. And as the day goes on, I want to make sure I'm aware of if there's any changes going on with that. Another thing I do probably even before going to the beach is check the local weather and the news forecast to see if there's any warnings out there. So the reason I shared that particular video is not because I think it's going to win an award for the best kind of documentary or anything like that, because it clearly articulated helpful information, but it was done with a, a limited budget. That wasn't a multi-million dollar production. It was short to the point, and any organization can create videos of this caliber and effectively articulate their mission and use the feature set to the best of its ability. Um, to further stress the point, in the Facebook news feed, if you look on the left, that's what it looks like when you share uh, a YouTube video on your Facebook page. On the right, that's the American Across example, when you upload a, a native video to your Facebook page, it takes up more property on desktop, more property, more, more portions of the screen on mobile, stands out in a more compelling way, far more likely to drive uh, engagement. When it comes to using Twitter and the feature sets that it uniquely offers, uh, let's look at an example from the European Commission. The European Commission tweeted about uh, John Claude Juncker's, the president's recent uh, State of the Union address, and they did a couple things just right. So yeah, they included copy with the tweet, providing the context and a link to the full article. That's great. But then they mentioned his Twitter account, John called Yunkard's personal Twitter account, bringing in the kind of ecosystem around him on Twitter within that tweet. They included the hashtag. So bringing this particular tweet into the overall conversation happening around the event. They included three images with the tweet, a very underutilized feature on Twitter. You, don't, you can not only share one photo, but you can share up to four photos with every tweet to provide additional context and to really help your tweets stand out better in the Twitter feed. It creates a little gallery that people can scroll through. And in this example, they included a, a quote directly from Juncker, a photo of him. They included the quote in English, French, and German to provide uh, additional context and to align the language. And then the fourth thing they did to use the feature sets of Twitter is tag his account as well in the uh, tag the photo. Uh, so if you see at the bottom, uh, photo tagging is also pretty underutilized and a really great way to further bring your, your tweet into the greater ecosystem um, that your organizations exist within. Um, there's only 140 characters. You can include a tweet that often doesn't leave a lot of room. So if you want to mention someone, you can do so by also tagging them um, in the photo itself. So for, again, to further stress that point, uh, at the top is an image of a tweet with just copy, with just a link. And then below it is an image of a tweet with three, three different images attached to the tweet, a hashtag, uh, three different individual accounts are tagged in those photos. It's obvious which tweet stands out more impactfully in the Twitter news feed. So I highly recommend incorporating photos, multiple photos, that add value to what you're saying. So the research phase is done. You've done extensive research. You, you've done your own studies. You've checked out the landscape. You understand the feature sets that each channel offers. Now you need to articulate those into a written, documented social media strategy. This is a critical step. This helps you better organize how your resources are going to be used how your team is coordinating to ensure that all your messaging is aligned. This is a key step in making sure your purpose is articulated at, at every moment across your social media. This is a key step to ensuring you're using the right tools. Are you investing the right tools to manage your content, 
to uh, make sure your team is on the same page, that you're spending your time effectively, and that you're measuring your goals. One of the most important things about setting up a social media strategy is ensuring that your goals are aligned, that your goals are front and center, and you can kind of create a focus for what you're going to do moving forward. And if at any point you're not hitting your goals, you'll know. But if you don't have goals outlined, documented, then you will have no compass for kind of how you're using social media moving forward. So once you apply that, find those findings to your social media strategy, it's created, you're executing content on a regular basis to best use your limited resources and what you have going for you at your institution, repurpose your content and better balance the creation of content and the distribution of content. So this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Selma Joffrey. She's a fellow content marketing consultant like myself. She says, create less, promote more. So there's two concepts to take away from that. First, instead of trying to create a ton of content, push it out on Twitter and Facebook, and chase after doing so many tweets for this blog post and so many tweets for this study, whatever you're sharing, you need to better assess the, the, the balance between distribution and, and creation. So instead of investing next month in creating 10 blog posts, instead of creating 10 blog posts that you're going to be sharing on Facebook and Twitter, how about you cut that in half, create five blog posts next month that you're going to be sharing on Facebook and Twitter, and in the time you saved from nixing those other blog posts, spend that time better distributing, better promoting the five pieces of content that you did produce. Spending more time on the distribution can help you better allocate your resources and remain efficient. Also, repurposing your existing content into other formats can help you from having to reinvent the wheel every single time you want to go tweet or set up a Facebook post. You take a blog post, you repurpose it and reformat it into multiple tweets, to a, another Facebook post, into an infographic. Maybe you take a couple blog posts and turn them into a study, turn them into a video so that you're using the information you already have access to that was already invested in and spinning it out into new formats so you can further distribute it with your audience. Let's look at some examples to better, better articulate that. So <clears throat> the Parliament of World Religions had a three minute long YouTube video to better repurpose it and make use of Facebook's native video feature. They created a trailer for the three minute long uh, YouTube video. The trailer is about 39 seconds. This way, they didn't have to reinvent the wheel and create a whole new video. They took what they already had, cut a part out of it, made a trailer, and are sending traffic from Facebook to that YouTube video. An effective way to utilize their time and stay on track with articulating uh, their mission on an ongoing basis. Um, a Mighty Girl is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to being one of the main education resources for the next generation of women leaders. And they regularly repurpose their written content into mini essays on their Facebook page. So repurposing is not an opportunity to just copy and paste. It's not supposed to be this easy solution. It's supposed to be a strategic way to work with what you got. They pull excerpts from longer articles, from a press release, articles of others not even produced by them. They pull the experts, excerpts, excuse me. They include them in the post. They provide proper context. They add links to their sources. And these long form posts do fantastic for them on a regular basis. This is a little bit against what most pages do on Facebook, most pages share content with short, quippy copy because people's attention spans are short. I get it. But that's not the only way to drive value. Another feature set of Facebook is the fact that their face in Facebook status, you can include up to 60,000 characters. That's uh, a typical novel is about 500,000 characters. 
So you can include about one-ninth of a novel in a Facebook post. Now, I'm not saying you need to write one-ninth of a novel for every item that you're sharing, but you can create a more in-depth resource on Facebook than the typical 100 characters that you're sharing. It's working for them, and it's working for a lot of other pages that are trying to kind of buck the, the existing trend. Um, and it's a, a great way of reworking the information that they already have access to and reworking the information of someone else. They're kind of curating content as well. Paying attention to snackable moments, short moments like uh, facts, figures, statistics, quotes that are, exist in your content, your videos, in a, in a recent speech, and pulling those out as tweets as Facebook posts. Uh, in, in this tweet, they pull out uh, the British Ministry of Defense, pulls out a quote from the Secretary of Defense about a recent humanitarian mission, and they wouldn't have been able to include this much information in a tweet if they didn't think to cr put the quote in an image and put a, uh, include a picture of him as well, creating a much more valuable tweet, making use of the, the unique feature sets, and they didn't have to reinvent the wheel they had this quote already, and they're just making more continued use of it. Twitter's retweet button got a recent upgrade. In about April, um, they added the ability to add a comment. So now, instead of just retweeting the tweet of someone else and sharing it with your existing audience, you can actually tweet on top of the other tweet as you're retweeting it. In this example, the United Nations retweeted the United Nations and Nigeria account, and then added an, an, a tweet on top of it, repurposing the idea, adding additional context, adding their own perspective, and making use of the feature sets of the channel. Super easy to do, and a great way to repurpose what's already out there. You do this by, uh, when you click the retweet button, it'll say add comment. You can add up a hunt to 116 characters, you can't add any media because the media, in this case, is the tweet that you're retweeting. Now, to address the other challenge of standing out on these channels that are getting more and more and more noisy, when you're sharing content as a nonprofit, as a government agency, as an international organization, you need to think of consistency, personalization, association, and innovation. Keep these themes top of mind to better address how you're using these platforms moving forward. For consistency, create unique series worth following, worth tuning into. Think of TV programming. Every Tuesday and Thursday, your favorite show is, is consistently at 8 p.m. Maybe your favorite show is at 5 p.m. every Friday. Think like that when you're creating programming for your Facebook page, for your Twitter account. Here, the uh, Room to Read, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving literacy among um, women in African and Asian communities, regularly shares quotes repurposed from others. They superimpose these quotes onto images they've taken um, in the field. They often add their logo to it. And these, these pieces of content are very simple, easy to make, on their own, they align with their purpose, and now they're known for this style of content. They're known for this particular series. And you can be too if you think about incorporating more consistent use um, of the content you're sharing. Uh, consistent use of hashtags. The Committee to Protect Journalists regularly has the hashtag press freedom with uh, many of their tweets, along with other hashtags. Use consistent hashtags that your organization, your institution has created uniquely, that are uniquely your, yours, and also hashtags that are popular and widely used and apply them to your unique purpose so that you can better associate your organization as a leader on that subject. You can better curate and organize your content. And you can better kind of, uh, in the same vein is the last example, better categorize and create a, a consistent series worth tuning in for, tuning into for your audience. 
personalization. Personalization is a fantastic way to improve your footprint on Twitter and Facebook by empowering your employees, your staff, your leadership, your spokespeople, so that they can use social media on behalf of your organization is a fantastic way to humanize your institution, give them the ability to discuss relevant subjects. In this example here, Samantha Power, the uh, US ambassador to the UN, regularly shares um, articles and issues she's discussing on her personal Twitter account. She regularly uploads native video on her Facebook page, shares relevant articles she's talking about, further addressing the issues that the UN is talking about on a regular basis and that the US uh, population should pay attention to. So consider empowering your staff, your leadership, with the proper training and guidance, of course, to better use social media on your behalf. Association. I've mentioned this a couple times already throughout the talk, is consistently associating your institution with others in the ecosystem whether that's individuals, organizations, ideas, conversations, you want to be associated with others to drive more visibility to what you're doing on a regular basis. Here, the Malala Fund uses the really popular uh, Women Crush Wednesday, WCW hashtag, and they regularly feature other prominent female uh, human rights advocates, excuse me, worth knowing. They give them some of their platform drive visibility to their actions, to what they're doing in the space, driving additional value to them, and vice versa, they get some attention from their audience as well. Further, setting up a community worth being a part of that can drive continued uh, engagement and further articulate your purpose. Uh, Red, the nonprofit that deals with ending the AIDS epidemic, uh, wanted to chime in on the back to school conversation. So in the US, when everyone's going back to school, all the kids in September, it's the back to school season, big shopping season. And Red wanted to be a part of that conversation, but in a relevant way. It doesn't make sense to associate yourself with topics just for the sake of it, but if they align directly with what you're trying to achieve. In this case, they created a program around the back to school hashtag they launched a Facebook and Instagram contest where the prizes were school supplies and a, a, a portion of the proceeds went to the organization to help find a cure for AIDS. They created the relevancy, they created a storyline to help further solidify the association that they were trying to make. Innovation. You wanna be looked at as a leader in your particular niche you want to be the government agency of record by consistently experimenting with the use of these channels, making smart investments, small investments, using underutilized forms of content, using features that aren't often utilized, uh, re, uh, reinventing how a, a popular feature is most often used in a creative way. Uh, here, uh, is a GIF shared on Twitter. GIFs are not often shared by government agencies and nonprofits because they're typically not that serious. They're typically of a joking matter, uh, they're funny, but they don't have to be. It's all in how you use that particular form of content to share your message. Here is a, an example of a cinemagraph, a type of GIF, where only a portion of the image is moving. So if you can look at our hand, that, that part's moving. This helps this tweet stand out in a much more impactful way than if it was just kind of a boring static image or no image at all. The uh, conference, the UN Conference for Global Climate Change also included a GIF with one of their tweets, really helping it to stand out in the Twitter feed. Again, using an underutilized form of content, setting an example for others to follow and helping them stand out from the crowd in a more meaningful way. This also includes the use of newer channels that don't have the exact cadence worked out yet, right? So at this point, there's a lot of rules to using Facebook and rules to what you should and shouldn't be doing on Twitter, right? 
With Periscope, like I mentioned, investment in Twitter allows you to invest in Periscope a bit and build off your established community on Twitter. Experimenting with Periscope and using it to tell a compelling story to your audience. For those who don't know what Periscope is, since it's a little bit newer, Periscope is uh, owned by Twitter. It's a way from your, your cell phone, or excuse me, your uh, mobile phone or your tablet to live broadcast with your audience. When you launch a broadcast, it'll send out a tweet with the name of the broadcast, alerting them, hey, um, we're going live, we're about to broadcast, come tune in. Here's an example of the United Nation and, and Hillary Clinton sharing a recent uh, broadcast. It allows you to share what's happening at your events, to show your staff in a more humanistic way, allows you to have a Q&A, &A, allows you to provide access that your audience didn't have previously. Um, I'm about to show an example for one of the clients, one of my, one of my clients, the Weather Channel. Uh, they regularly use Periscope to do behind the scenes of their uh, signs, behind the scenes Q and A of their newscasters, answering questions that uh, viewers are asking about the weather in a particular area. Um, as you'll see in a second, comments come in on the left. And that's where people are asking questions, saying this feed is great, I'm interested in XYZ. And then the, the person who's manning the phone or tablet is the social media manager for the Weather Channel. And she's calling out the questions to the news anchors. She's calling out the locations people are, are tuning in from so that she can better um, address the right questions with the news anchors, the people that you know, your audience typically doesn't have access to. So let's take a look. Indiana, Indiana, Chicago, Connecticut. It's good to have you all. Milwaukee, Oklahoma. Way to go, Midwest. The Midwest is representing. Good morning, Brooklyn, Canada. 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 This is exciting. Arshan, sorry about that. Thank you. Hi, Florida, Miami. Come on up here. Should Southwest Florida be worried about Invest 96? South Florida? Not anytime no. soon. Yeah. We're talking thousands of miles away from the U.S. It's probably not hey, even going to be to the uh, Windward it. Islands over the next five Tokyo, days. Tokyo, Jersey, yeah. Morocco. So they got one question across. Um, on the left-hand side, that's where all the comments from live viewers are com come streaming in. And again, this is a great way to set the standard for how government agencies, how nonprofits use this channel to better articulate their purpose on an ongoing basis. There's still so much space to innovate on Periscope since it's a new, new place, so it's important to make smart bets. Uh, using an underutilized feature to innovate, uh, Facebook Q&A, often underutilized because it's only available to verified profiles and pages, uh, but Facebook is now granting access to this feature to other government pages as well, even if you aren't verified. Uh, the Q&A feature allows you to have an ongoing uh, Q&A session with your audience. Uh, it's kind of a, a new and different medium, a way of reaching influencers uh, and you know, celebrities. Here, uh, Jens Soltenberg, the uh, Secretary General of the NATO, uh, just did a recent Q&A that was pretty interesting in the range of questions he received. Everything from what's it like to live in Brussels to how should NATO best deal with the refugee crisis pl plaguing Europe. It's a fantastic medium to connect with your audience, better humanize. It's still unscripted. There still isn't a whole lot of rules as to how you have to do it. There's some, some cadence there, but there's a Fantastic opportunity here if you're a government, uh, if you have a government Facebook page to use this feature in an interesting way. So, as you're aware, Facebook and Twitter regularly change. All these platforms change. The way you're supposed to use them consistently changes. Your audience is going to change. But despite the changes to Facebook and Twitter, despite the regular changes to the social media landscape, despite your changing tactics and messaging, it's really important that you stay purpose-driven with everything you're doing on social media to ensure you can quickly adjust to these changes, achieve your goals, and continue to achieve results. Remaining purpose-driven 
allows you to stand out and be consistent with your use of both Facebook and Twitter as lead platforms. If you'd like to look at this presentation again, uh, review any of the examples I showed, you can get it at uh, bit.ly slash Brian at NATO. It's just bit.ly slash Brian at NATO, all lowercase. Thank you so much.